Hello everyone. In this series of continuous medical education, my topic today is post myocardial infarction ventricular septal rupture repair. My name is Dr. Nido Parikh. I am an associate professor in the Department of Cardiac Anesthesia at UN Mehta Institute of Cardiology and Research Center, Ahmedabad. So let's start. Ventricular septal rupture is a rare but lethal complication of acute myocardial infarction. Ventricular septal rupture complicating myocardial infarction was first described at autopsy by Latham. One of the first anti-mortem diagnoses of post-infarction ventricular septal rupture was made by Brun in 1923. Sager in 1934 described specific clinical criteria for diagnosis and stressed the association of post-infarction VSR with coronary artery disease. In 1957, Cooley and colleagues reported the successful surgical repair of post-infarction VSR in a patient nine weeks after the diagnosis of septal rupture. The perforation can range in length from one to several centimeters. It can be a direct through and through opening or a more irregular and serpentinous course. Rupture of the septum with an anterior infarction tends to be apical in location, whereas inferior infarctions are associated with perforation of the basal septum and have a worse prognosis. These are few of the images of VSR. So what are the clinical features associated with increased risk for rupture of the interventricular septum? These include lack of development of collateral network, advanced age, female sex and chronic kidney disease. On auscultation, a new harsh, loud, holosystolic murmur heard best at the lower left sternal border, usually accompanied by a thrill, characterizes a ruptured interventricular septum. Biventricular failure generally ensues within hours to days. So let us look at some of the characteristics of VSR. The incidence is 0.2 to 3% without reperfusion therapy and 0.2 to 0.3% with fibrinolytic therapy. 3.9% in patients in cardiogenic shock. The time course has a bimodal peak within 24 hours and 3 to 5 days. Usually occurs within 2 weeks of the infarction. What are the clinical manifestations? Patients usually have chest pain, shortness of breath and hypotension. The physical findings include harsh holosystolic murmur, thrill, third heart sound, accentuated second heart sound, pulmonary edema, RV and LV failure and cardiogenic shock. The echocardiographic findings include ventricular septal rupture, a left to right shunt on color flow Doppler through the ventricular septum and pattern of RV overload. On right heart catheterization, there is increase in oxygen saturation from the RA to RV and large V waves. So as we have talked previously on echocardiography with color flow Doppler imaging, we can recognize the left to right shunt. Also by insertion of a PA catheter, to, we can document the left to right shunt. Rupture of interventricular septum after STEMI carries a poor prognosis with a mortality ranging from 40 to 75%. The likelihood of survival depends on the degree of impairment of ventricular function and the size of the defect. But because the rupture can expand, prompt repair is necessary even in hemodynamically stable patients. Septal rupture is often repaired surgically, although transcatheter closure may be considered, particularly when the patient is deemed inoperable and the anatomy is amendable and feasible for the application of a closer device. So this is one of the image where a percutaneous transcatheter closure of an ischemic ventricular septal defect has been shown using a cribriform occlusion device. The development of myocardial infarction Ventricular septal rupture, the MIVSR, is a lethal complication and that can be saved by an early referral, swift echocardiography evaluation, cardiac catheterization, and operation at an appropriate time. The preoperative stabilization by anotropes and mechanical support has shown to improve the outcome of these patients. Although the recommendation for an ideal timing may differ, the studies are in favor for surgical repair as the definitive treatment. Ventricular septal ruptures complicate 1-2% to of the MI in pre-thrombolytic era and account for 5% of all peri-infarction deaths. There is a tenfold in decrease today due to implementation of early thrombolysis and myocardial salvage. It occurs usually within 2-6 to six days but it can be any time within the first 2 weeks following an acute infarction. The median time from the onset of infarction to septal rupture was 1 day in the GUSTO-1 trial and 16 hours in the shock trial. The onset and severity of symptoms depend on the size of the defect and without reperfusion, the coagulation necrosis develops with disintegration of adjacent necrotic myocardium around the defect. 
This complication is usually associated with total occlusion of the coronary artery leading to infarction of the interventricular septum. The operative mortality depends on the status of preoperative hemodynamics which in turn is related to the degree of shunting and the extent of the acute infarct. In surgically treated patients, the 30-day and 1-year mortality rate was 47% and 54% respectively, whereas in medically treated, it was 94% and 97% respectively. Hence, surgical effect was definitely a treatment of choice. Other risk factors are old age, location of the MI, urgent surgery, female gender, EF less than 40%, previous cardiac surgery and or MI, lack of improvement in hemodynamics in spite of anotropic support, shorter period from infarction to surgery, total occlusion of the infarcted artery, right ventricular dysfunction and pathologically complex type. Preoperatively, nitroglycerin infusion initiation depends on the hemodynamic stability with a view to decrease afterload and left to right shunt and to improve the coronary perfusion. Induction of general anesthesia is particularly challenging as an increase in systemic vascular resistance can increase the shunt flow and myocardial oxygen demand. Another concern is to maintain optimal perfusion pressure while lowering the afterload and also to maintain the SVR-PVR ratio so as to reduce the shunt fraction. The post-operative management also should be focused on to prevent the tensions of the VSD repair sutures. The aim is to reduce LV afterload and at the same time to maintain hemodynamics during the post-bypass period. Ventilating these patients at an early stage to achieve hypocarbic alkalosis and good oxygenation that reduces the PVR and thus improves the intrapulmonary shunt. Other considerations include avoiding hypoxia or, hyper or hyperoxia and myocardial depression. The ideal timing of VSD repair is a point of debate. Most of the guidelines recommend immediate surgical intervention to prevent further hemodynamic deterioration, whereas few other studies support delaying surgery if feasible for optimization with medical management before surgery. In one study, Pang et al. found only 2 per of the 38 patients which remained fit for delayed surgery and concluded that it was applied to only a few selected group of patients as the friable VSD enlarges during the first 10 days and waiting for myocardial maturation is not an entirely feasible option. Subjecting patients to delayed surgery for perioperative optimization and mechanical support, on the other hand, may allow myocardial scar tissue formation and facilitate the technical aspect of VSD repair or an early percutaneous treatment which can be an alternative option. Delaying surgery may present these patients with improved and better organ function and made to undergo a relatively lower risk procedure at a later stage after preload reduction and preoperative optimization and that could be possible reason for shortened postoperative intensive care stay. However, most of the studies have shown that the prolonged medical management at times is risky and even futile in few situations. Ventricular assist devices have been shown to be able to provide a bridge to surgery and are placed postoperatively as well to allow for restoration of the peripheral organ perfusion and to provide recovery and maturation of the infected myocardium. By decreasing afterload and preload, VADs can help to provide the rest and increase coronary perfusion to the shocked myocardium. Blanche et al. in one study found that the postoperative use of an IBP in acute MI reduces immediate postoperative mortality but does not improve the long-term survival. The percutaneous ECMO also provides numerous benefits compared to conventional VEDs as they are economically efficient, prevent stenotomy, provide oxygen support and are easily reversible. Recently, the percutaneous closure devices have permitted less invasive management in patients post MIVSR. A questionnaire search using 31 best evidence papers showed that the insertion of an occlude device in patients with post-infarction VSD not amenable to surgical repair offers benefit in selected patients and so the authors concluded that device closure technique might avoid the surgical closure in selected patients. In few selected patients, they may provide a time for VSD to mature and optimize the patient acting as a bridge prior to surgery to offer the best possible outcome in this group of patients. Current evidence suggests that in patients with defects less than 1.5 cm, subacute stage and for patients who are poor surgical candidates, the percutaneous intervention is a more attractive option than conventional surgery. More recently, 
In a series of 29 patients with percutaneous option, 41% patients experienced procedure related complications and the overall 30 day survival rate was 35% with higher mortality in patients with cardiogenic shock. Although it appears to be an attractive option, there are more suitable for congenital VSDs that are muscular, smaller, with well defined and healthy edges. Not only are the post infarction VSDs larger, but also their rim consists of unhealthy infarcted tissue that degenerates over time and increases the VSD size. Due to this, there is high likelihood of device dislodgement and malposition. This technique offers some advantage of being less invasive and option to bridge, as previously stated. It may improve the pulmonary hemodynamics and allow for myocardium to heal and fibros to facilitate better surgical repair and improve the outcome. However, significant advances need to be made in the device design and further studies are needed to validate the durability of the percutaneous approach and to compare the results with the surgical repair. The echocardiography, as shown previously, has been a very useful tool for diagnosing interventricular septal rupture easily in the patients of acute MI. It is recommended that every new onset or progression of right or left heart failure following MI should lead to a further diagnostic procedures including immediate echocardiography. Recently, real-time three-dimensional TE plays a key role in guiding the device placement both during percutaneous and surgical management. It also helps by providing reliable information about the size of the VSD and quantification of the initial and residual left-to-right shunts through the defect. A single-center study with 32 patients during the 22 years of experience showed that an early mortality of 20-20%, 20, 26% had residual shunt and 5 patients required re-operation. The overall 5-year and 10-year survival was 55 and 41% respectively. The recurrence rate of VSD of the initial surgical repair of post-infarct VSD have been reported to range from 10% to 44%. The posterior location of VSD had been found to be associated with poor prognosis in most of the previous studies. A ret retrospective multicenter study showed that patients who underwent early VSD closure had higher rates of residual shunt and mortality. In addition, the mortality rate was higher after early percutaneous closure. The all-cause mortality was 40% and the authors recommended a vigorous pursuit of closure post-MI VSD with a sequential surgical and or percutaneous approach for improved outcomes. A long-term follow-up study involving 35 patients showed 30-day mortality of 31% and actual survival was 66%, 62% and 68% at 1 years, 3 years and 9 years respectively. To improve the surgical result, double patch technique and glue have been recommended and shown to avoid the recurrence and reduction in the hospital mortality. Generally, the NYHA class at presentation and the post-operative continuous renal replacement therapy are predictors of early mortality and the age and time between MI and operation are independent predictors of 30-day and long-term mortality. The outcome can be significantly improved in selected group of patients with sensible preoperative preparation and aggressive perioperative management. To summarize our anesthetic goals, we have to reduce the left to right shunt by reducing system of vascular resistance, maintain norbocarbia and avoid hyperoxia. In conclusion, management of a patient who is acute decompensated cardiogenic shock should be directed at reducing left to right shunt with afterload reducing agents and IBP placement. There is no clear evidence to guide the surgical management of patients who are in shock as all approaches have been shown to have extremely high mortality. Thank you.